Hey there, and welcome to Cyberpunk Librarian. I'm Daniel Messer. On November 19, 2015, I spoke at a session of the 2015 Annual Conference of the Arizona Library Association, usually abbreviated as AZLA or ASLA. Like many state library conferences, ASLA is three days of networking, sharing information, keynotes, talks, lunches, visiting beer, food, company camaraderie, and it's both fun and educational. I enjoy going to library conferences because I love to see what others are working on and maybe pick up a few ideas for myself. This year's ASLA conference was no no exception at all. I had a marvelous time and would like to take a moment to thank the AZLA for the opportunity to speak and the library I work for, the Maricopa County Library District, for the opportunity to attend. I don't often talk about the library I work for here on the podcast, and that's intentional. Now try and keep this show as library neutral as possible because I don't want it to be just a podcast for public librarians like myself. I hope there's plenty of stuff in academic, medical, legal, special, or any other librarian can get out of this. But I think it'd be okay to give a quick shout out to the place I've worked for over 10 years now because Maricopa County Library District is a pretty great place to work. My co-workers are awesome, the librarians are amazing, the staff just rocks, and while I don't always have a perfect day where everything goes right, I always learn something new and do something interesting every single day. So big shout outs to MCLD and AZLA. They made this episode possible. This is Cyberpunk Librarian, episode 39, live from AZLA 2015. My name is Daniel Messer, your friendly neighborhood cyberpunk librarian, welcoming you back to the show that explores the intersection of libraries and technology and is all about living that high-tech, low-budget lifestyle. Hello, hello, Cyberpunk Librarian is back on the air and back on the fiber and bringing you a special episode from the Wild North. And in this case, I mean Flagstaff, Arizona, which, if you look at a map, is quite north of Queen Creek in the land of Az. Flagstaff is a beautiful college town and the home to Northern Arizona University and this year's AZLA Annual Conference. It's also up in the high country, just shy of 7,000 feet high or 2,100 meters for the rest of the right-thinking world. That means during this time of year, it's a place in Arizona that actually gets cold and regularly gets snow. So as an added bonus for your asthmatic host here, my asthma can be set off by both altitude and cold. Needless to say, there were times that I'd wished I'd packed a scuba tank. But that's okay. You know, this is uh, this is all right. And this is a talk that I gave at AZLA and we're talking digital signage. This is a subject near and dear to me because I think it's an important field in the library marketing world. And quite frankly, it's a lot of fun. I love doing new and interesting things with digital signs, and I love sharing what I've learned so others might harness the power of some inexpensive tech and make this stuff work for them, too. So, without further rattling on, this is Delivering Your Message with a Slice of Pie, Raspberry Pies and Digital Signage, live from AZLA 2015. Check the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. Please welcome Daniel Messer. Hey. 
Thank you. That was lovely. So hi, my name is Dan. Um, I'm going to turn this on real quick because even though I am not Carrot Top, there will be props. So OK, let's get this thing going. So hi, my name is Dan. I am the web content manager for the Maricopa County Library District. Um, they say you should start out these things by saying something about yourself. So I've been uh, in the library field for 20 years. I started when I was 19 years old. I'm 39, so that math was easy. Um, 29 years geeking out on computers. I started when I was 10, so that math was easy. Uh, I'm a slider, and a slider is a, uh, a term coined by a, a, a podcaster friend of mine called Nightwise. Um, a slider is someone who moves from operating system to operating system to operating system and does not care what they are using. At home, I run Windows, Mac, and Linux. I carry iOS, but I have an Android phone at work, and I have an Android tablet. I use everything. Because if nothing else, as a web guy, you have to test on everything. Because the browser you don't test is the one that it breaks. Thank you, Internet Explorer. Anyway, I'm a podcaster. She just said I host a show called Cyberpunk Librarian. I also have an occasional show called Intragalactic Librarian. Um, I'm an author with a couple of books. Uh, I'm a musician, and basically what you should get for this is I get bored really easily and find stuff to do because while you know busy hands are happy hands, the occupied mind is not homicidal. So, uh, a couple albums, View from the Maltheus and Orange Standard Time. I write basically atmospheric, new agey, go to sleep kind of music. So, okay, yeah. So, before I even get started, let's uh, do a couple... Uh, Housekeeping things, if you do need a restroom, they are right across the hall next to the lovely conference room that is right there. So, you know, it's, it's real close, real easy to get to. And uh, for this thing, I see some of you have notes and iPads and stuff like that. You, if you like, take notes, fine, that's cool. But uh, you can write a bunch of stuff down or you can just go to this website, um, cyberpunklibrarian.com slash digital dash signage. Uh, all of my notes, slides, walkthroughs, podcasts, all that stuff that I'm talking about today is right there. So, okay. And let's see here. Great. Come on, play along. And speaking of podcasts, I'm recording this. Hi. Welcome to episode 39 of Cyberpunk Library. So, <laughs> so let's talk digital signage. Now, obviously with a name like Raspberry Pi in the title, we're going to have props, and the prop is a Raspberry Pi. Now, this is always taking a chance trying to do a live demo during a uh, presentation, but it was working 20 minutes ago, so I, I have some faith. Can I see four raspberries, please? Not yet, and there, good, okay. This will just run throughout the thing. This is actually one of the uh, digital signs that I have created and that we use in the Maricopa County Library District, so you can actually look at what one does. So, okay, so, you know, why bother? Why bother with digital signage? Well. You save on paper, you save on ink, you save on printing costs. Um, if your library is like ours, where we're very event-driven, we're very event-focused, and there's always a new event, there's always something new, and there's always something next week, and something next week, and something next week, that's a lot of paper. It's nice to just be able to put it on a big screen, and we have big screen monitors, something like 38, 40-inch monitors in each branch, that some of them hang too high, but that's okay. Um, the, the, the uh, customers can come in and they can see what's coming up, you know. So, okay. It saves on your uh, paper and ink. They're easily updated and duplicated. So, um, if you have, like, uh, our white tank branch has two digital signs running off one Raspberry Pi because you can split a video feed. It doesn't matter. Um, in this case, we don't have to print two posters. We don't have to have two sets of flyers. We don't have to have two sets of bookmarks. We can just put it on a screen in the library and a screen in the lobby, and that's all there is to it. Multimedia, I mean, you've already seen it, literally started up with a Star Wars thing. If you don't think that Star Wars grabs a kid's attention, especially right now, or at least a 39-year-old man's attention, um, <laughs> yeah. The, uh, I, love, um, I love print posters. I love print media. Um, we have a digital uh, and a graphic designer named Lucas, and he is amazing. He did this one, as a matter of fact. This is Lucas. Um, you can tell. He knows what he's doing. Um, so uh, I love that stuff, but you can do multimedia with a digital sign. Um, so you can do the static images. You can have multimedia. It can be a sort of in-your-face movie kind of thing, or it could be something very simple, you know, kind of like that library card one. There's one in here that's just basically an animated GIF. I mean, you can, you can do a lot. Compelling content. 
So Lucas knows what he's doing. So you know things like that are pretty. But hey, look, dinosaurs. Um, you know we had a dinosaur con, and this was actually a Creative Commons footage that we you know, were able to use, and you know it's great. Uh, obviously, you can have audio output with a digital sign. You're crazy if you do, but um, this makes sense without audio. I mean, you don't have to hear this thing roar to know that it just roared. So that's you know that's kind of cool. People are going to stop and look at the dinosaur they, as they walk past the poster. So yeah, that's our old logo. Pay it no mind. <laughs> okay. Also, it's kind of everywhere. This that uh that's downtown Shinjuku. Um, that, yeah, there's digital signs everywhere. And I'm not talking about the neon. I'm talking about this thing, and this thing, and this thing, and that thing. And oops, let me fall over the thing. Again, that'll be the second time today. It'll be great. Digital signs are everywhere. They're out in the lobby out here. They're in the conference center. So the thing is, you might even say it's the future. This is from Blade Runner. That was, you know, what, 20, almost 30 years ago? And they've got digital signs. Um, so they're everywhere, and you don't, you, the thing is, is you don't need to be expensive with them. A lot of people look at this, they see, you know, they see this projector, for instance. This is a really nice projector. I love this. It's about $800. That's expensive. Wow. However, a uh, big screen monitor these days, you can get them for 200 bucks. You don't need a high-end, top-of-the-line Sony thing. You can get these, and if you put them up in places where people can't just reach up and fiddle with them, they last for years. I mean, we've had our digital signs hanging in our branches for nine years, maybe, and we've lost one monitor, just burned out. And they're cheap, so we kind of expected one to burn out, but nine years later, we finally had to replace one? Okay. So what we had and why it was horrible. So the reason we started this project using Raspberry Pis is because we had another brand of digital signage called Potomac. Now, I can't say anything bad or good about them because I really can't say anything about Potomac anyway. I'm not sure if they're even in business anymore because when I tried to contact them on three separate occasions, I got nothing back. I tried on their website. I tried the contact we had. I left a message on a voicemail and never heard anything. Uh -huh. But they're expensive. They were about $800 per screen because Potomac's run on a small form factor PC running Windows 7. Bit of overkill, but we'll get into that. Uh, it also had a $1,000, roughly, no one knew the cost, we bought it a while ago, central server um, that lived in our data center. So we've had 18 screens, you know, times eight, you know, $800 per screen, $1,000 central server. So, yeah. Also, the hardware was overpowered. Small PCs running Windows 7 to do a glorified slideshow? It seems, seems excessive because if you have Windows, you need to fiddle with Windows. You need to license Windows. You need to update Windows. You need to lock down Windows. And not that you don't with these, but we'll get into why it's a little bit better. And this PC would be tucked behind a TV, pressed against a wall, and it was a wonder we didn't lose them more quickly than we did because you take a PC that's got a fan and shove it against a wall that's flat up against the television, and yeah, it gets hot. <laughs> they burn out. And like I said, far, so, far too much power for a simple slideshow. And what really led to switching to Pies is the software was buggy as sin. Um, it was Java-based management app that you actually used to upload slides, manage the system. Um, it was a Java app that had never been updated, to my knowledge, at least in the three years that I've been the web content manager. Um, and it was starting to throw errors on every major browser except Internet Explorer because there are Java updates and there are Java security problems and Firefox and Chrome both said we're not playing this game anymore and they basically just ceased supporting this system. I mean, I'm sure no one at Firefox looked at Potomac and said enough of this, but it did not work. So it worked only in Internet Explorer and we know all how, you know, how secure that might be as you're running unauthenticated Java on a self-signed server that... Hmm. So Firefox, even Edge, the Microsoft Edge browser, wouldn't work. And it was outdated. So uh, the central server was running on Fedora 14. They're currently up to 22, I believe. So a little out of date. Um, and it's one of those things where I don't just hop on and update the server. I don't know what the software does. I don't know how it's interconnected. I didn't even know what directory it lived in at first. Um, 
what do I break by updating this? That's one of the reasons I call Potomac. Hey, you got updates? And crickets. And the, uh, the kernel on that server was 2.6.35. Uh, uh, They're currently on 4.3 release candidate 2, last I checked. So it was wildly out of date. So yeah, it just did not work. So enter the Raspberry Pi. One fine day when we were trying to upload slides to the central part of the server, this would be the slides that go out to all 18 screens. So these are basically the branch-wide, district-wide, everybody needs to see these slides. It threw an error. I logged into the server. I did a couple of small updates. I rebooted it three times, and it throws an error. No one knows why. Um, so it's not working. And it came to the point where, okay, it's finally broke enough. So let's fix this. So I am a nerd, and I love playing with toys. And I told my boss about these things. This is a Raspberry Pi. This is specifically a Raspberry Pi Model B. There are several versions. That's a uh, Raspberry Pi 2 that's running there. A little bit faster, a little bit more processor speed. Uh, the cool thing about this is, is that's the upgrade. That's the newest one. Costs the same as this one. They didn't raise the price. That's pretty freaking sweet. So, okay. So, if you just get the board, you're looking about 60 bucks. Cheap. Cheap, cheap, cheap. Um, but that does not mean it's cheaply designed or cheaply engineered. These things are great, and you'll find them in more and more places. Um, so, yeah. So the Raspberry what now? So yeah, this is, uh, like I said, a Raspberry Pi 2, or a Raspberry Pi Model B, but there are more like it. Um, the Raspberry Pi runs off a micro SD card. The original ones ran off the full size. Uh, now these are great because you can lose them even easier, but they do lock in, so that's good. Um, all of the operating system, storage, uh, storage medium, everything is on that card. So since you're pulling from an SD card, it's fairly fast. You don't have a spinning disk. Um, you'll also notice the complete lack of fan. It's fanless. Uses very little power. This thing is plugged in with a micro USB cell phone charger. You probably have five of them in a drawer at home. So, you know, if a power supply stops working, you can get one relatively cheaply. I and mean, you can buy them in bulk. You can go to Goodwill and get them in bags. So, yeah. So, these are inexpensive, 60 to 80 bucks. I put $80 up there because we buy ours as a kit, and I'm gonna hold all this crap up here. You can get them in kits. Um, the kits, kind of, obviously you probably don't just wanna hang this down behind a TV, it's an exposed circuit board. <laughs> um, so you can get these kits, they come with a case, they come with a power supply, they hook up via an HDMI cable. So they already uh, output high definition uh, pictures and video. Um, as a matter of fact, these things will process Blu-ray quality video. So, pretty cool. <laughs> so um, these, uh, these little kits, I get these from Kana Kit. They're about 80 bucks. Sometimes you catch them on sale. And they're incredibly easy to assemble. As a matter of fact, I'm going to just see if I can do this while I talk to you all. Uh, they're small. As you can tell, they're about credit card size. They don't weigh anything at all. Um, I, when, we, uh, when we switched, I got a box of 20, and I could easily just heft the box with one hand. Okay, I'm missing a piece here, so... There it is. So, okay. They're highly hackable. You can do almost anything with these. You can use them in robots. You can use them for digital signs. You can use them as little tiny Minecraft servers. You can use them as web servers. Uh, some people use them as a small content server that they just, you know, will hang up at their house, and now they have a method to get into their computers at home. You can do a lot of stuff with them. So, actually, the funny thing is using them for a digital sign is really kind of a dumb use, it's, but it works. Um, so yeah, snap that together, snap this together, or got it upside down, and it got a little USB wireless dongle. That's it. So yeah, really easy to put those together. They run on FOSS, free open source software. The Raspberry Pi runs off of Linux. There are a few flavors, um, I'll get into that in a second, but they run off Linux, and Linux is free open source software. You pay nothing for Linux, so you don't have to pay to license Linux, you don't have to pay to update Linux. If a new version of Linux updates, you just download it. You don't have to give Microsoft money. And I have no problem giving Microsoft money. I've given them tons of money over the years. But for this, just it works better. 
And the operating system runs on the micro SD card. I prefer one called Raspbian. If you know anything about Linux, there's a, uh, a distribution called Debian or Debian. Raspbian is the Raspberry Pi um, optimized version of that. So yeah, great. But why? You know, why Pi? Like I said, they're inexpensive. These are literally 10% the cost of a Potomac box. 80 bucks versus 800. So yeah, the, uh, the expense already made the boss smile. It's like, wait, they're cheap? Yes, they're cheap. So 18 Potomac boxes plus the uh, server cost, you know, about $14,400. 18 pies, $1,440. Um, there was a central server. There was no server cost for that. We repurposed something that we were throwing out or surplusing. We don't throw anything out. We're the county. So, okay. Like I said, runs on free open source software. That includes the server. The server's running Ubuntu server. Free. I update it when it needs updating. No cost. And it's not a powerful server because I'll get to it in a minute. It's not like some, you know, big blade server that's sitting in there, you know, running and running. This thing is like five years old or something like that. So, yeah. I told you about that. So, yeah, the central content server runs Ubuntu. And the, uh, the actual software that runs the uh, slideshow, the video, and handles all the stuff in the background is called Screenly OSE. Now, there is a paid version of Screenly. OSE is short for Open Source Edition. They're energy efficient. These do not have fans. They do not have uh, any moving parts whatsoever except the SD card, which pops in and out. Um, so they're very energy efficient. So the cost of running a full-blown PC behind a television versus the cost of running one of these, uh, it's a huge dip. I don't have numbers, but it's a huge dip. Because they're fanless, low power, micro USB. Yeah. And they're small and easy to hide behind a monitor. I can hide these anywhere. Matter of fact, there was a, a thing on um, one of the hacker blogs or something like that where someone had basically set one of these up as a uh, pseudo Wi Fi network at a Burger King or something like that. And they were basically hacking Burger King's Wi Fi. So, nah. <laughs> Nefarious, but they're small and easy to hide behind a monitor. You know, I can throw it under here and you won't know it's there. So, okay. Gearing up. So let's, let's make the thing. I've told you why. Now let's do the thing. So, okay. So we used a Raspberry Pi um, system. These, these are from Konakit. They come in different cases. Sometimes they ship as black. Sometimes they ship as clear. I don't care. It's going behind a monitor. I don't care what color it is. It could be Raspberry Pi pink. That would be awesome. So, uh, yeah, there's the uh, URL. And this is all in my notes as well, so you don't have to write that down. Um, so yeah, we get ours from Konakit. This is the kit that we actually buy. It comes with the case, the Wi-Fi dongle. Um, yeah, it comes with the micro SD card that's already preloaded with an operating system, uh, the power cable, an HDMI cable. So literally, this is all you need to get set up and running except a keyboard and mouse. I'm sure you might have one laying around. So okay. The server is a Dell PowerEdge uh, 1950. It's about six years old. I think it has two gigs of RAM. I don't know what the processor is other than it's a Xeon because I don't care. Um, it runs Ubuntu server. And behind the scenes, it's running um, basically a LAMP stack, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. Um, and the only reason it's running that is I might get into something with that later. But for our needs, which I'll explain later, you don't even need that much. You need Apache, which free. In case you haven't noticed, all we've bought is Raspberry Pis. We haven't even replaced monitors. You could actually run the content server on an old PC or netbook. When I was doing my testing, I was running multiple screens off of an old Dell something that we have tons of in our branches and that we've actually phased out. I just went and got one. Um, so you don't need a big, you know, Harkin central server like this. Uh, literally, a netbook would do it. It's, it's that low power. Setting up. So you would download and install the Screenly OSE. And like I said, I have all of this in my notes. Um, but installing Screenly is pretty easy, especially if you've played with a Pi before. Uh, you have two choices. You can download their custom image, which you can just flash to the little micro SD card. Or you can just download the software and install it. Their, um, their website has really decent instructions. You can pretty much copy and paste. So even if you don't know a whole lot about Linux, you can go there, copy, paste, hit enter. It will run through its thing. If you read the text, it's actually kind of funny sometimes. They'll say things like removing this and replacing it with a better hack. So yeah, I mean, they've got a sense of humor. 
So there's, you know, that, that's screenly. And then once you get this set up, so, you know, I played around with this thing. I probably had five, ten different iterations of what, you know, what you finally see here. But once I got that set up, I went back to Windows, because it's a little easier on this one and use the, you know, a free open source thing called Win32 Disk Imager. And what this does is take your little micro SD card, you plug it into an adapter, because most computers don't have a micro SD card reader, slot it into your computer, and then using this, you just create an image. So I got it right, the first, you know, I got it right on the 10th try or whatever. This is what I want. I'm going to deploy this to 18 branches. I don't need to do this 18 times. What I need to do is make 18 copies of this card. Took a little while, but it was a lot easier than setting up 18 new pies. And when you plug the card in, it's the same thing as the first pie. It's cloning. It's disk imaging. OK, so solutions. Because there were certain things. I'm just checking my time here. There are certain things that Potomac did that Screenly doesn't do, at least not the open source edition. Now, Potomac was really great in that you could schedule things to go up and come down at given times. You don't want to run a slide for an event six weeks before that event happens. Maybe you do, but we don't. Um, you want to like go, go live a couple weeks, maybe a week. And then after the event's over, you want that slide to come down because you look stupid with signs up that say, you know, this, you know, coming soon, this event that happened last week. So Potomac did that. So does Screenly. You can schedule your slides, your videos. Um, it even processes a website, which I'll get into in a minute. You can schedule those to go up and come down as you want them to do. So that's great. You can schedule months, years in advance. So uh, that's nice. Potomac did that, but uh, Potomac also did a district-wide slide deck. So for things like the um, the uh, like downloadable services, we have new library cards. Like that new library card video, we would want that on every single screen in the district. Um, Potomac, you know, did district-wide slide decks. That's why we actually replaced it because it stopped doing the district-wide slide decks. That's no fun. So yeah, it did that. So as a replacement, what I set up, because I didn't want to pay for this, because I don't know if it's worth the money yet. I can tell you it probably is now. Um, Screenly will also process a web page. This has lots of things that you can do. If you have like a meeting room system that actually displays the bookings on a website, throw it on a screen. Do you want to show off something new on you know, some web page or something? Throw it on the screen. Do you want a district-wide slide deck? Create an internal behind-the-scenes thing on that, uh, that web server that I told you about, the internal content server, and use a J JavaScript and jQuery to just flip slides. That's all it does. It's got like three or four slides on it, and every 10 seconds, it changes. That's it. And then I set it on Screenly. You know, how many slides are there? There are three. I want them to show for 10 seconds apiece. OK. So I need to show this website for 30 seconds. That's it. So you upload that to every single image that you have, every single Raspberry Pi. And uh, now all you update is that one website. So if I, you know, we're not promoting Freegal right now, we're going to promote Overdrive. So I go to that web server. I edit the index.html. I usually just rename a slide. And every five rotations of the, uh, the cycle, Screenly checks for new content. So you can pretty well rest assured that within half an hour, your new district-wide system is going out to all screens. It's updated all of the systems by then. So yeah, that took care of that. That's, that wasn't all that hard to do. The other thing was central control. Screenly, unlike Potomac, um, does update through a web browser, but there's no JavaScript. There's none of that, or there's no Java, sorry. There's no Java, none of that nonsense. It's just HTML5, JavaScript, that kind of thing. Um, so that's great, but it didn't have a central control. So if you want to you know, update the white tank one, you have to go to the white tank one. You want to update the Litchfield Park one, you got to go to that one. You have to know all the little IPs, and uh, you could do it, but it'd be much better if you had a central control. So with a modified bootstrap template and a, uh, a sidebar, I think that's what it was called, left sidebar bootstrap, whatever, um, I just built that. And the code is on GitHub, which is also in my notes. So if you want to just download it, fork it, do your own thing, they're on GitHub. You can just download the code. So this is what it looks like. And this is almost exactly what, um, what the Potomac system looked like. We had a black bar on the side of it. I tried to keep it as 
familiar as possible for everyone that's going to be using it. And down the side, you have your branches. Click the branch, and it populates the screenly administrative thing over here. Now, as you can see, you have the uh, active assets. You have their start and end times. You can, I know it's a little hard to see, but you can edit it or just delete it, and you can turn them on and off. So, you know, the holidays are coming up. We're not going to be doing the Wednesday story time until January. But the Wednesday story time is still going to be happening at the same time every Wednesday. Well, don't delete the slide. Just turn it off and turn it back on after the first or whatever. So that's, that's really nice. Um, adding an asset, I don't have a screenshot of that, is really easy if you've ever uploaded a photo to Facebook. It's pretty much the same system. It's just that in this instance, you're going to tell it, hey, I want you to start at this date at this time and come down on this date at this time. OK, so standalone. We also did a system with uh, Raspberry Pis on smaller screens. We wanted to have basically a shelf talker that could go on near a thing, and then we can promote, you know, cross promote other things with that thing. Put a small monitor shelf talker next to the magazines promoting Zinio. Put a small shelf talker next to the DVDs promoting Hoopla. So you can't find that movie? Well, try Hoopla. No, stuff like that. Um, so we did that, but we didn't use Screenly because while Screenly is nice, it really, 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 really wants to be connected to a wired interface, which, okay, but these things we want to be able to put anywhere where there's power and Wi-Fi. So we used a slightly different system. Uh, so we used older monitors. We bought nothing new except the Pies. We ha it's IT. We've got a crap load of monitors just sitting there doing nothing because, once again, we can't throw them away. So why not use them? These are uh, single image signs using a browser, specifically using Chromium, which is the open source version of Chrome, in a kiosk mode, which is full screen. So, you know, they've got no uh, keyboard connected to them. So, you know, there's not much you can do with that browser. There's nothing connected to it. So it's just going to be Chrome, basically, in a kiosk mode displaying full screen. And it's pulling stuff right off the Pi. So it's all local. So it's very fast. You're not trying to pull a whole bunch of stuff through the Wi-Fi at the same time. And remember that website that flips, image, that flips images? It's portable, same code. I copied and pasted. Um, so yeah, just use that. And like I said, that's on the Pi itself. But how does it get there? And how do you update it? There's a Linux, uh, Linux program called rsync. If you've ever worked with Linux, you probably know about it. Um, if you don't, welcome to rsync. Um, rsync is one of those things that you are assumed that you kind of know what you, you are doing um, because with it you can, you can sync two directories or you can delete both of them. It's great. <laughs> but um, like I said, if you check my notes, I've got a, uh, I've got a, a, a sample command that you can use. So it just updates in the background with rsync. So yeah, they are connected to the Wi-Fi network. But instead of trying to pull a beautiful, large PNG through the Wi-Fi every time it tries, it pulls it off the, um, the uh, Raspberry Pi. And just in the background, our sync says, you know, every 10 minutes, check the content server, pull down. That's it. If it's the same stuff, nothing really happens. It checks the content server. Do we have ABC? Yes. Do we have ABC? Yes. Nothing to do here. But when there's an A, B, D, and C is gone, it will pull the new stuff down. And the, uh, the, uh, the web code on that particular instance has one small change. It refreshes the browser every 10 minutes. So every 10 minutes, the browser refreshes and makes sure it's pulling the latest stuff off the Raspberry Pi. So it's updating in the background. You never see any of this happen. And in some, time, in some cases, it's nerve wracking because we had a couple that weren't behaving properly. And I don't want to force the change when I'm fixing it. Hello. I don't want to force the change when I'm fixing it because I don't know if I fixed it if I did that. So I get out there. I you know, make what I believe is a change. And then I have to literally stand there for 10 minutes seeing if this monitor flips or not. And thankfully, they did. So it, it, that was my fault when you forget a comma. So OK. Here's just a couple of examples that we're going to go through. So this is one of the big screen. Um, big screens that we have hanging uh, in our branch. I know that's a crappy picture, but if you've ever tried to photograph a monitor. Um, so anyway, I pushed some sliders around in Photoshop. This is what I got. Uh, these are Olevia. I've never heard of them. I have a feeling they were you know, made with pride in the North Korean Republic or something. I don't know. But uh, we've had one of these burn out. They're 
cheap, but they work. And they have HDMI hookups. That's all you need. As long as you have an HDMI hookup, you're good to go. Um, if you don't have an HDMI hookup, adapters work. Um, the video splitter, like we have at White Tank, uses only VGA. So I had to get an HDMI to VGA adapter. Well, so OK. This, for instance, was used for a, uh, a large uh, conference that we had, a library con, uh, which is basically a comic con at the library. 1,500 people. It was amazing. But you know, you've got different conference rooms. There's different things going on in this room and this room, kind of like here. And what do you see in some of the uh, kind of digital signs right outside the room? Here's some digital signs. That's one of those repurposed monitors. Um, with, the, uh, with the code in um, Raspberry Pi and Raspbian, you can tell it to flip it pretty easily. And that's exactly what I did. So we could put the logo up here. Here's everything that's happening in this room. We had one for conference room A, B, whatever. And Here's a big screen version of it. Um, this is one that was just out in the hallway where people could see it. And same thing. Here's everything that's happening at this conference. Um, this Darth Vader thing with the books and the eyes for books and everything, that's, that's Lucas. Lucas knows what he's doing. So I just blatantly stole his art. But he works for the district, so it's the district's art. Anyway, <laughs> so um, yeah. And these didn't have to update. You don't, I mean, if it's just displaying a static JPEG, you can display a static JPEG, whatever. Um, once again, they did not have keyboards or anything hooked to it. So um, Screenly is a bad example because this is running Screenly. But once you get this up and running, you have to remote into it to deal with it. So SSH, whatever tool you want to use. If I came over here and hooked a, hooked a keyboard up to it, I can't do anything. It won't let me in. That's a security feature. Why do you want someone coming up and plugging a keyboard into your digital sign and mucking about with it? You don't. So yeah, you have to be able to um, administer it remotely. But there are all alternatives. So I've just spent all this time telling you about Raspberry Pis. How are we doing on time? Good. I've spent all this time telling you about Raspberry Pis, but you don't, you don't have to. I mean, maybe I don't. Our district is lucky in that we do have some money laying around for this kind of project. Um, maybe you don't, or maybe you want one now and you don't have 80 bucks. Well, okay, there's alternatives. It doesn't have to be a Pi. You can do a lot with a simple slideshow. Like I said, it, it's running a glorified PowerPoint presentation, so why don't you just use a PowerPoint presentation? You can put that on a screen. You can animate and have it just cycle, cycle, cycle. Now, granted, you do lose the ability to upload and um, not upload, but update it as you want. So you will have to manually add and remove slides. But if you've only got a couple screens, who cares? Um, so yeah, you can, you can just do a lot with a simple slideshow. You can have it, you know, call on a website and just do like I did with the, um, the JavaScript and jQuery image flipping thing. Um, so yeah. Uh, a PC running LibreOffice Impress, so if you don't have money for a Windows you know, license or an Office, you know, office license, uh, you can use, li you can use LibreOffice Impress, which is their open source version of PowerPoint. You can use Google Slides. Um, Google Slides isn't a bad idea either because you could update multiple screens from one central interface. Um, sort of the uh, central moral of the story is you, if you want to do one of these things, you can do it in a whole variety of ways. Hack around and find the thing that works best for you. Um, you can use, like I said, the full screen website and computers calling content in a full screen browser. Um, Chrome and Chromium is great for this because Chrome, you can easily give it a, uh, just a command line that says, you know, Chrome, is it Chrome minus minus kiosk minus minus incognito, which basically clears any errors that would ever come up. Um, and then the URL that you want to call. You put that in any startup script, any start thing that will just do that when the computer comes up. It works. Or this is getting interesting because I want to do this. Um, there's new Chromecast video things, and you can do all kinds of cool things with the new Chromecast video, and I want to build a sign out of it. Um, I bet that's cool. But uh, you can hack around with the Chromecast or Roku. Um, Maybe not as great an idea because the Chromecast is about 40 bucks, but a cheap Roku is about the same price as a Raspberry Pi. So, um, but if you have one laying around, the Chromecast is really interesting because of the connection to Google services. A uh, friend of mine, he has the best job in the world because he, uh, he's basically a label designer. He's a graphic designer, and he designs labels for um, 
different products in Washington State, but one of the things he also does is he's a beer connoisseur, and he designs a lot of beer labels, and he does this uh, part-time gig in a bar, and it's a microbrewery type thing. They've got all kinds of selections, and he hacked this thing together using a Chromecast that basically called on a stylized spreadsheet in um, Google Sheets to show, all right, here's what we have on tap. Here's the alcohol content by volume. Here's the price of it. Here's how much growler costs. And if they ran out of something, they just go to the spreadsheet and update the spreadsheet. And I believe they hit F5 on a keyboard someplace and pushed it to the screen. So yeah, you've got options. The Roku was particularly interesting. Um, but a screensaver will do it too. If in doubt, almost everything has a screensaver. Once again, you lose the ability to up, you know, upload and download on a given date and time. But a lot of screensavers, or there are free screensavers out there, that do nothing but display a picture, and then display another picture, and display another picture, which you can call from any place that you want. You want to say, I want you to display pictures from this network drive that I can now update from a central location. You can do that. And commercial options exist. Do you want to pay for something? Do you really, really, really want to buy something? Be my guest. Um, because if you buy something, you don't have to do all of this yourself. Um, it so happens that I'm a nerd, I'm a geek. I love you know, hacking around with web code and fiddling with something and, oh, that didn't work, well, let me try this, and that didn't work, and let me try this. Well, that kind of worked, but I bet it can make it better. So yeah, commercial options exist. Um, Screenly has a paid option. Uh, there's another one called Rise TV, I believe is what it is. Um, there's all kinds of stuff, but I want to tell you a little story real quick. Um, one of the things that sort of spawned this idea is that we have a, um, kiosk out at um, AZA, which is the uh, Mesa Gateway Airport. Uh, I was talking to one of their PR people out there, a lovely lady, I believe her name is Tiffany. And I was looking around and I noticed some of their screens, which you can see behind, Raspberry Pis. So I was like, hey, 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 tell me, tell me about this. And she said, yeah, these are great. Then we use them everywhere. So at Mesa Gateway Airport, they, they're calling on web content through a full screen browser, I think they're using Midori, um, that shows pretty much everything. What arrival and departure times. At the gates where you have the sign that says, you know, this flight's coming in, it departs at this time, whatever. Raspberry Pi's calling web content. That's awesome, that's cool, I I'm gonna do something like that. And, but then I pointed out there's two, I think two, screens right at the baggage claim, big screens that aren't Raspberry Pi's, and the reason you can tell is, see how smooth this is? And it's not even particularly great video, but it's smooth, you don't see any jitteriness, you don't see any bumping and jarring, you do on these. And I, well, what's that? What's wrong with those? Oh, that's not Raspberry Pis. That's running this, I think she called it black box. And we hate it because it, it does the jitteriness. It's not as smooth. It's not as easy. So if you are going to look for a commercial option, go find someone using it. Because if you came to me today and said, hey, I'm looking into using Potomac, I would, no, no, you're not. You might think you are, but you're not. <laughs> So yeah, commercial options exist. And just sort of a uh, you know, last thing here. This is, a, uh, this is a Roku, you can see it up in the corner, um, running a digital sign. And the way I got this working, this, the, the slide doesn't fit because it's a huge slide on a tiny monitor. Um, things about this big. The way I got this working, once again, free software. Um, Roku has a uh, channel called Plex, which pulls from a Plex server. And one of the things a Plex server does is serve media. Videos, pictures, seeing the pattern? Videos, pictures. And with the, um, with the Plex uh, photo thing, you can say, hey, play me a slideshow of these photos. So if you have a Roku laying around you want to play, you, know, you can do that too. Uh, Plex is free. There is a paid option. But for what I used, I didn't pay anything. Um, make sure your slide fits your screen. That just looks silly. That is all I have. Um, so if you have questions, I would love to hear them. Um, I didn't get into the whole technical aspect of this because it's one of those where go look at my notes and then email me if you have questions. And like I said, this is all on, uh, this is all on that, uh, the website there, cyberpunklibrarian.com slash digital signage. Um, email me with questions, whatever. But you know, like I said, there's a bit of technical nonsense in the background where you're hacking around with Linux, you're hacking around with Windows, but if you've worked with computers a little while and you've worked with Linux for even six months, you can do this. This isn't hardcore, you know, updating the kernel stuff. <laughs> so, okay, does anyone have any questions?
awesome. I know I'm standing between you and lunch. That's why I want to get done a little bit. <laughs> Y'all should go to lunch or something. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for coming. And that about wraps up another episode of Cyberpunk Library, and I hope you enjoyed the talk because I certainly enjoyed giving it. It's always nice to sort of, you know, to speak in front of people. That's one of the reasons I do this show is it gives me a chance to get on the air and sort of live out my fantasy of having my own radio show, but I don't have to get a broadcaster's license or anything like that. It's pretty cool. And hey, speaking of broadcasting, I wanted to give you all a heads up that I'm going to start uploading episodes of Cyberpunk Librarian to YouTube. So for those of us who actually do use YouTube for, uh, well, not so much for video, but sometimes just for music and audio, you'll be able to pick up the show there if you want to. It's going to be youtube.com slash cyberpunklibrarian. This show will go up as well as the last show, and I'll start uploading older episodes as well. So yeah, check out YouTube dot com slash cyberpunk librarian for this show and others and of course you can always pick it up in the usual places on itunes through the rss feed and cyberpunk librarian.com slash podcast where you can hit up the show notes for this very episode and pick up all the other episodes that came before and all those that are sure to come after The song you're currently digging on is Catching Rays by Psychedelic Pedestrian, a favorite here on the show because they are so awesome. Earlier in the show, you heard New Life by Teen Days, and as always, the opening track is Belly Dance at Abisu by Ryo Miyashita. You can check those out. I'll have them linked in the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. Cyberpunk Librarian is hosted by the Internet Archive at archive.org. Great people doing great things, saving and preserving the Internet. They've got all kinds of cool stuff over at the Archive, from written word to spoken word to videos to video games. Great stuff over there. I thank the Archive for hosting this podcast and podcasts like it and podcasts that are nothing like it. Internet Archive at archive.org. Check them out. If you'd like to get in touch with me over the social networks or something like that, you certainly can. I am at Bibrarian on Twitter. That's B-I-B-R-A-R-I-A-N. It's like librarian, but it starts with a B. Also, you can pick me up at Google Plus. I am Google.com slash plus Daniel Messer. Or if you prefer the old style SMTP method of communication, that is okay by me. I am cyberpunklibrarian at gmail.com. Drop a comment in the show notes. Drop me a line over the email or the social networks or whatever you like. I love hearing from my listeners. So if you've got a question or an idea for a show, I would love to hear from you. And with that, let's go ahead and wrap this up and get on out of here. I will see you again in two weeks for the next episode of Cyberpunk Librarian, which drops every other Monday. And hey, you don't have to be high tech to be low budget, but it certainly helps if you're a cyberpunk. Take care. I'll see you next time. 